Uh, so Joe Torcella, former uh, 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 road scholar, uh, former deputy mayor of Philadelphia, founding CEO of the National Constitution Center, U.S. rep for the United Nations under uh, uh, a fellow by the name of Barack Obama, and now the 77th treasurer of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Uh, treasurer Tresella, welcome. Thank you. And according to one of your comments, the greatest treasurer in the world. Who I yeah. think is someone who may work for me, but we'll leave that alone. <laughs> you love that. Uh, it's nice to talk to you, Larry, and it's good to be here. And welcome to all of our uh, attendees. I want to invite you, uh, Treasurer, uh, to join me in a glass of wine. I decided to start uh, uh, drinking wine during these things. At the end of the day, uh, I've you know been home all day. Yeah, I think it's and so so. Well, this takes me by real surprise, but I just have to have a glass here. Larry and I did arrange this in advance, folks. It's six o'clock and we're all at home. So uh, it seemed like a way of making this an even nicer event. You can, the Philadelphia Citizen Cocktail Hours going forward. Cheers. That's, that's right. Cheers. Um, and uh, so let's begin. First of all, I see you, you're in your home library. Uh, what's, uh, what's, on the, what's on the shelf behind you? Uh, well, we've got some biographies. We've got uh, Bowling Alone. We've got The Idiot's Guide to Fly Fishing. Uh, we've got uh, Henry Clay. We've got a business book. It's, it's a variety of choices. I, I, I like that. I think that, that, that describes the, your breadth, uh, the, the, the Idiot's Guide to uh, Fly Fishing and Bowling Alone, which we'll get to, because I think that um, more than any uh, public servant on our uh, uh, stage, uh, you're uh, a communitarian, and we can talk about what what that means. Uh, for for fifteen years, twenty years, I've been hearing you talk about mm -hmm. the meaning of we the people. Uh, this this idea of a collective, and I I, I want to uh, uh, get to that. But but before we do, uh, since you're you shared from your bookcase. Let me let me read to you a very an old description of you in uh, in Buzz Bissinger's A Prayer for the City, um, which if if you guys haven't read Prayer for the City, you still you need to. Uh, it's it's uh, a, a great read about if if you're curious about Philadelphia. Um, this was uh, a young Joe Torcello was the deputy mayor for policy. I want to say uh, in the Rendell administration which the city was almost bankrupt. You're in these negotiations with the unions uh, and young Joe Torcella sends a memo uh, to the mayor and the chief of staff, David Cohen. Uh, and it's-, it's yeah, not, but I, I have this book, should I be fact checking your quote? Or <laughs> I'm not gonna read from the memo, although the memo is, I'm gonna read what Bissinger wrote. It was a fine memo written with precision and thoughtfulness and a strong trace of the good government piousness that Torcella, a true and earnest believer in the midst of crotchety wolves and coyotes was known for, but it represented the ideals of government, a government that was proactive instead of reactive and one that determined its own fate instead of waiting for the latest kick in the teeth. So it really didn't represent government at all. Uh, so outside of the, the shot at the end there, um, uh, knowing I was going to talk to you, I went back and looked at this and I thought, is that still Joe Torcella? Or do you, do you recognize that, that, that description? And is that, do you still try to, uh, live that, those precepts? I mean, uh, my answer is, I guess, I hope so. Um, I do think, by the way, there's a little bit of a shot at the beginning of that, which is, was a fair one and probably still is a fair one. You know, his... I think his, I forget his words, his you know, true and earnest believer is not entirely complimentary. Um, but I do, I did then and I do now. Um, and I think this is one of our abiding challenges. I believe in public institutions. Um, and partly that leads me, frankly, to want to reform them when they don't work. Um, and we haven't done enough of that. And as a result, we've had, you know, I've talked about this, we've had a kind of terrible corrosion of our faith in public institutions. And now three plus months into a pandemic might be a good time to reevaluate, you know, how's that working out for us? Answer badly. I, I hope that's still me. I think as you go through life, you know, you accumulate 
uh, you, 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 know, you hopefully shed some of the wide-eyed quality that I think he's describing. Um, but I do, I, I begin, you know, I begin each day trying to remember to think that this is about public service, not about, you know, the, 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 the sport element of it. Um, and I still have aspirations for institutions that, you know, frequently exceed their current expressions. So I guess, I mean, that, I think, I think for better or for worse, that's probably part of who I am. By the way, it's not in the book. Buzz has written great books. Um, the best thing he ever did for me was not that characterization. Um, he set me up on a blind date uh, with the love of my life, who's now my wife of nearly 25 years. Uh, yeah. The story in itself, but we won't go there. Um, it's funny. I, I, I didn't take that as a, as a, a shot. Uh, I, I, I took it as praise for your, um, for your uh, uh, idealism, which, which maybe, maybe I'm just craving idealism in these times. Um, but, or maybe I just have really thin skin. Well, that's, that's, uh, but I, I do think that one of the things that's interests me is that you, your position is one that historically has either been a sort of glorified accountant or a way to get indicted. And, and you seem to have seen that this was, that you could actually use this office to reform government. Uh, can you walk us through that and 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 without get we'll get to the big reform which is which i think is the, the one of the most exciting things in pennsylvania maybe the country which is keystone scholars but before we get to that to like just this idea of using the treasury's office and and, and i think you're doing it a lot in terms of pandemic uh right now yeah i actually i mean I, i'll talk for a minute about what we've done over the course of the pandemic but backing up slightly i, I think i've always tried to see opportunities in positions and places that other people had given up on, um, and I think that's I think that's one of the themes of you know my 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 the path of my career. Um, and I remember the very day that I decided this office that I should run for this office. I I was uh, read an article in the New York Times about, and I think this is what we're going to talk about, um, what some treasurers were doing around financial empowerment, and I thought, aha. Um, but I saw it as this broad, you know, what's the famous, uh, is it Archimedes, the give me a place to stand and I'll move the world. I thought this was a place with a window into almost every issue that mattered in Pennsylvania and in Pennsylvania's lives. Um, and, I, and it has frankly exceeded my expectations for my ability to do that, which were high to begin with. In, over the course of this pandemic, apart from the unsung fact of you know, how we have kept a department of 300 plus people, you know, paying the vital bills and answering Pennsylvania's questions through all this. Um, we advanced $700 million to hospitals and loans, found a creative way to do that at a time they were really hurting. We uh, extended a line of credit to the Commonwealth through the end of the fiscal year for $2 billion. We persuaded um, two of our largest banks, at this point, 50% of all banks, to cash stimulus checks fee free. We used the power of our shares uh, to, when we learned ventilator manufacturers were prohibiting hospitals from making repairs so they could have the repair contract on their own. Uh, we led a little coalition of treasurers and got the leading ones to change their ways um, and putting tens of thousands of ventilators back into circulation. We effectuated the most uh, favorable student loan debt relief in the country um, for Pennsylvania borrowers and uh, 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 folks who borrowed um, through FIA. Um, and we sent out nearly a million rent rebate checks um, six weeks earlier than that otherwise would have gone out putting, you know, millions of dollars in Pennsylvania pockets. That's in a, that's in a tiny little few month window. And that's to me a kind of emblem of I think there is no bad job in public service. And if, and if you think you have one, you should get out of public service. The, these, the, these jobs have, you know, extraordinary impact on real Pennsylvanians or Philadelphians or Montgomery Canyon's lives. Um, and I, you know, we could, we could spend 10 of these sessions with me telling you how that's so, but it is. Well, and, and if you agree uh, that inequality is the issue of our time, 
uh, it seems to me, and I think I wrote this when you were running on this issue, and it was very rare to see someone run for public office on an idea. <laughs> um, this, 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 this notion of Keystone Scholars, I think, is an innovative way to attack inequality. It, it, uh, tell us what it is and what the genesis of it was. Yeah. So you, you, you said that, you know, I, I, I talk often, you know, Carolyn says obsessively about this idea of the American we, and it's always been my touchstone you know, since, I mean, even since before the Constitution Center, frankly, but it was kind of cemented there. And at, by the way, at this moment, where we're living through, you know, a reckoning um, around racial justice and our failure uh, to, you know, to truly live out that we or the more perfect union, it's kind of more relevant than ever. I, I started talking uh, about what, I, I, I said I wanted to do three things as treasurer. I wanted to restore integrity and and accountability and bring some real reform to state government, a, a state where we punch above our weight when it comes to corruption scandals. Um, <laughs> I, I wanted to be a tough fiscal watchdog, um, and that's played out in lots of ways, not least what we've done with with uh, money managers and Wall Street fees. Um, but third, I said, I, I really wanted to use this office to rebuild that we, that I thought inequality was, was the issue of our time, that, the, that we are coming apart and have been coming apart in all kinds of ways. Um, and that I thought this office could actually do something to re-knit those ties. And the idea that I ran on, you alluded to is, and this was what I, the, the article that I read that sort of put me over the edge and just said, I want, I want that office and I want to do that with it, was if you give a kid, I mean, we, we, have, a, we have a just insanely out of control higher education uh, costs at the same time that incomes of American families have been stagnant over decades. And along with the other things, crushing, crushing American you know, pocketbooks, um, that's one of the big drivers. And it's also one of the big drivers of who's, who's able to thrive and who's getting left behind in the 21st century economy. And there's all this research that says, if you give a kid a savings account at or near birth, um, and say this is for some higher education, not necessarily for your college, but something after high school, um, that that kid has a seven times greater chance of going on to and completing some education after his or her high school years. And I thought that was a kind of an amazing policy idea, you know, that this, that this, and it didn't appear to relate, it doesn't appear to relate to the amount in the account, it's the fact of the account. And I, in my own life, I equate this to the $25 savings bonds I used to get when I was growing up, which at the time I thought were the world's worst gift. Um, but because they're presented with a message, this is for your education. They were a message about that, but also about, they were a message to me about community, about the fact that there was this network of people who were there to help me. Not that that $25 was gonna pay my tuition, but they were there for me and they had my back and they were there to give me a little nudge and all of all those things together. It was really powerful. And as you know, that time that I grew up in and that town are, they're not the same, but in, in 2020, we can do something and did do something that delivers that message. We created a program, Keystone Scholars. Every child born or adopted in Pennsylvania um, at birth gets a hundred dollar deposit into a 529 savings account. That will grow to you know, maybe $500 by the time that child graduates high school. Um, but more importantly, most importantly, that's a message about who we are in the state where we you know, have the privilege of calling ourselves a commonwealth, another word we throw around, but uh, you know, lose opportunity to make it mean something. And who we are and who we should be and who we have been, never perfectly, but who we can be is a community where the kid that I was growing up in Berwick and the kid that you were growing up in Lower Mary. Correct. Uh, um, and, you know, a kid growing up in West Philadelphia and someone growing up on a farm outside of Erie or in Pittsburgh, we're all, all those kids are part of our Pennsylvania future. And, and the idea that we could do something that really move the needle on, on driving down higher ed costs that would start to even up the playing field and that would send this message that I think I try, I've tried to be all about this message of we, you know, really appealed to me. And, you know, fast forward, 
Um, we got it done. We did it in a bipartisan way. It's now being copied by states around the country, you know, very different states politically, by the way. Um, we're, we're the first large state uh, to legislate this. And in a, in a Pennsylvania political history where we're often the first at all the wrong things, that's a really proud achievement of mine. I'm, I'm, I mean, I couldn't be happier we did it. I want to build on it. I, want, I think one of the things we need to do is make it more progressive, frankly. Um, but we did it, and it means something. And mostly to me, what it means is trying to recreate in some way that sense of community. When you say more progressive, target it more towards need as opposed to a blank. I don't want to target it. I don't want to target I, I think it's very important the program always be universal because, again, that's sort of the statement. What right. I think we need to do beyond the hundred dollars, though, is do something for you know because this crisis has fallen disproportionately on um, on on some of our communities. I think we need to uh, do something for lower income families that goes beyond a hundred dollars. Um, you know, Tennessee has a program, for example, where they uh, have a four to one match of a deposit that a low income family makes up to a hundred dollars, uh, meaning potentially $500 deposit. I want this to become a kind of, you and I have talked about this baby bonds idea. You know, we, we have this yawning chasm of inequality. I think, I hope, you know, events, both pandemic and the grappling we've been doing uh, around issues of, of discrimination and racism. I think this conversation is, is happening with some more urgency. Um, but I hope we can we can really begin to grapple with that. You and I have talked about this baby bonds idea is one way to do this. There's a, an awful lot of life that we attribute to things that belongs to luck. I, I was lucky to be born where I where I was and, and, and with the community around me where I was. Um, we need to create we need to create that luck for a lot of people in Pennsylvania in in whatever way we can in our time. So I so my my future ambition for this is that we start to build and layer on this program. Um, I will tell you, by the way, we just got back to research on the, the, the pilot project and what it showed just blew us away. Um, it has raised the rate at which parents are opening their own 529 accounts for their own kids by a factor of two in every area and across every demographic, meaning Low-income, single parent, no college education. Oh, well, that's new. Twice as likely to be opening and putting a little bit aside for for uh, his or her son or daughter. And that's that's new, right? Because I I think I no, I don't think I've shared that with you before. No. Yeah, and and I I think I remember research that showed that five twenty nines were were sort of the province of the middle class. And weren't reaching down, so that's interesting. That, that, that's what you know when you looked at the map of our 529 penetration, which is a great program, by the way, and and especially with the crushing burden of student debt that is weighing down graduates now, um, is really important. But you looked at the map of where we were, where it was being used, and it was being used in the places that needed the least. Right. And look, everyone should have one, but it broke my heart to see that. You know, in in the most affluent counties had the highest use of this, and and the counties um, that were least, you know, that had the highest poverty rates didn't. We have to change. We have to change that. We have to figure out. You know, we have got to figure out interventions that we can get a consensus on that begin to even up that playing field. And this, in, in its own modest way, is starting to do that. We often tell people, by the way. The myth of the 529 is it's you know it's for it's for rich people with financial advisors. When higher education is has been required for 95% of the jobs that we've created since the end of the Great Recession, when the unemployment rates are twice as high now for folks who have some education after high school and those who don't, we the, you know higher ed is the armor for the new economy. It's not going to necessarily it's not a silver bullet. But it's dangerous to go out there without something, whether that something is a one year, a two year, you know, some certificate or four years. And we have to get serious about evening up those odds. Uh, we tell people if they put aside twenty five dollars a month um, that their kid will have ten thousand dollars by the time that kid is graduating high school. People don't understand the connection between what seems trivial, twenty five dollars. And and now you know, we're in a we're in a world where. Many people can't scrape together $400 for an emergency, and that, that's also part of the problem. But 
my point is we really have to, this is, I love the universality of it. We also have to target it you know, begin to target it even more clearly to moving the, moving the numbers around inequality. So at the risk of like, uh, uh, nerding out too much on this stuff. Uh, you mentioned baby bonds, which I was a fan of in the 90s when Tony Blair did it in Britain. What What is it, What what, and how does that differ from the pilot program you're doing? Well, I, you know, if you talk to some of the national es experts on what we're doing, they will tell you it doesn't really differ. That, that in a way, what we've done is create a kind of baby bond around some form of post-secondary education. But baby bonds in its truest form is, you know, we're gonna give you, we're gonna give at birth to either to everyone or to, you know, to, to low-income families, we're gonna give you kind of a stake in the economy. We're gonna give you some money that will grow over time that can be used for, you know, whatever you want upon adulthood. Now, if you ask me, I could wave a wand and do that nationally. I would do that in a heartbeat. Um, but if you ask me, what is the quickest way to do something like that with the mechanisms that exist and in a way that has a reasonable chance in a politically divided time of getting a consensus? Because by the way, this was passed in a Harrisburg where both houses of the legislature were under Republican control. Um, and it had a, you know, Senator Hughes from Philadelphia, Senator Gordner from Columbia County. Um, it had that kind of uh, representative, uh, representative uh, uh, from you know, representative from the Republican side and the Democratic side. Um, if you, this has the ability to bring people together in a time when there's not a lot you can say that about. Um, so I would tell you this effectively is a, you know a, a sort of a baby bond, and we ought to build on it and elaborate on it and have it become have it have it reach its full potential. I hope, by the way, someone is listening in a company or in a foundation um, who will hear this and will say, yeah, we want to, for Philadelphia, um, we want to do an add-on deposit for every low-income family in the city. We want to do an add-on deposit um, you know, for every family where the child gets enrolled in pre-K. We want to do, I, I, I hope this becomes a platform not just a fact of you know my three and a half years as treasurer. Yeah, you know, um, uh, I don't think your any of the funds for this come out of the 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 state budget, right? You've done this fully on a uh, uh, foundation. Uh, we, we, did, we did it. We did the pilot on philanthropic uh, contributions, um, and we're doing the ongoing program on investment earnings. Um, that that are not in the in the state's general fund, uh, in our in in one of the accounts that are for the purpose of higher education. Uh, but we are open for business in accepting philanthropic um, and charitable contributions. Um, I will note that for the last three years, I've given I've, I've turned down my automatic pay increase and given it to this program. Um, now that's nice; it makes a tiny bit of difference, but. Yeah, I'm, hope, I'm hoping someone, uh, you know, one of the citizens funders is listening to this. And in addition to funding the citizen, <laughs> it's a very good thing to do. Wait, wait, wait to look out. Um, <laughs> you mentioned, you mentioned uh, your uh, Wall Street interventions. Uh, what, do you, what do you mean by that? What, what did you, in what way did you stand up for the taxpayer of, of Pennsylvania uh, w against the Wall Street uh, titans? Well, you know, two ways. One involves dollars and the other involves, you know, results. Um, in the dollars way, I, as, as somebody who, yeah, I worked with Jack Bogle at the Constitution Center and um, for a while thought I knew better, but eventually came to the conclusion that a lot of what Wall Street peddles is high price nonsense. The idea that you can beat the market is a particular kind of snake oil um, that a lot of people have made a lot of money off. Uh, now, most many individual investors have come to realize that over time it keeps growing and growing. Um, but a lot of institutional investors, like you know, before I arrived, the Commonwealth, um, and still many pension funds, you know, pretend otherwise. Even though we, I mean, I could bore you all night with the with the with the studies proving that they're wrong. Uh, but the first thing I did, and this went to 
both dollars and cents and my, and my sense in a different way uh, of, you know, that Wall Street was picking our pocket, but also, frankly, the corruption. Um, first thing I did was say, you know, we're going to, at Treasury, uh, the 20 billion that we are responsible for ourselves, we're going to index the, you know, those funds. We're not going to pay for people to tell us falsely they can beat Wall Street, who, by the way, in the past often happened to be politically connected, and that had something to do with the corruption scandal. So I, I banned middlemen on my first hour, but then over the course of the first 18 months, switched to index investing. We've saved $700 million in doing that um, for taxpayers. And we, I think, have frankly shut the door on the possibility of some of the corruption we've seen in the past. I, I've been advocating, the governor's been advocating to do that more aggressively at our pension funds, which, as you know, have some, you know, face some real trouble. And as a, as the son of a pension fund beneficiary who always reminds me that's what she's buying gifts for her grandkids on, um, it, it's it's something I care deeply about. One of the funds has made some real progress, and and the, and the fees are going down. The other, in my view, has not. It, in fact, it pays out more in fees to Wall Street in a given year, um, in the last year we calculated than every member of that pension sends in in contributions in that year. That is a recipe for several things, but it is not a recipe for long run success or for taking care of those people who've given their life to public service. It is a recipe, frankly, for Wall Street continuing to pick our pockets. So the first thing has been to be vigilant and ever vigilant about fees. But secondly, we I'm the custodian of our investments and they're not an abstraction. They're your money. They're my mom's money. They're every Pennsylvanian's. I mentioned Commonwealth. That's what they are. They're literally the Commonwealth of the Commonwealth. And I've used those to speak out when Pennsylvanians are getting hurt and when they're getting screwed. Um, in, in the pandemic, we used our power as a shareholder to say to the ventilator companies who weren't letting hospitals uh, re repair ventilator equipment, you know, we think you need to switch course, and some of them did. Um, we've used it uh, to uh, engage with companies who have a lot to answer for, for the opioid epidemic um, that has really devastated Pennsylvania and its communities and families. And at a couple of them, we've succeeded in changing corporate governance. We've used them at Facebook, where you know, which has such an outsized influence on our economy to say, gee, given the, you know, the extensive uh, mischief that, is, that, that, that you've presided over, the idea that you don't have an independent board chairman um, watching over you, Mark Zuckerberg, you know, is, is bad governance. Every year we've gotten you know, closer, and, and I think the numbers we've gotten are getting their attention. Um, we've used it when Donald Trump took us out of the Paris Climate Accord. We used the power of our shares to sign on to the we're still in letter and says, no, actually, when it comes to Pennsylvania, we're, we're still part of this. Um, I could kind of go on and there, you know, there, there, we, we don't, there are thousands of ways we could do this that we, you know, we don't, we don't do everything, but when something profoundly affects Pennsylvania, as I think all those things do, you know, opioids and COVID and, and, and uh, climate, I'm going to use our resources to make our voice heard and to stand up for Pennsylvanians when they're getting abused. We, we, the other thing we did that hasn't happened in decades is we actually led a class action when evidence came to us that Wall Street banks were manipulating the price of what are called agency bonds, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which are invested in by a lot of public entities. Um, and we saw this evidence and we, we, we took them to court. And a few weeks after that, one of the, one of the banks uh, you know, uh, started cooperating and evidence came forward that what we were alleging was in fact true. There were chats it fixed the prices of these bonds. And it sounds innocent enough when you say, oh, it's a couple of basis points, you know, a fraction of a percentage point. Um, but on a large scale, that is literally ripping off taxpayers. We recovered $400 million for taxpayers around the country. Um, and so I'm going to, yeah, it hasn't been me wildly popular, but I'm going to keep doing it. Who was it that said uh, uh, a billion here, a billion there, and suddenly you're talking real money? I think uh, it, it was it was some Washington it was Everett Dirksen or some Everett Washington. Dirksen, I believe that's right. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned Facebook. Uh, yeah. you and I've had conversations with Chris Hughes, uh, who was Zuckerberg's uh, uh, partner and roommate at at Harvard, who has come out for a uh, uh, 
a data tax that Facebook should be should be taxed on 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 the on the fact that it has uh, uh, inured uh, a lot of bottom line success on our data, which I think is a fascinating uh, idea. Um, and let me just ask you, Larry, do you you have you have a board at the Philadelphia Citizen, right? Yes. Do you chair it? I do not chair it. Of course not, because anyone. I mean, everyone gets this basic idea of, you know, sort of checks and balances. Most companies get this basic idea. Uh, but in this, you know, this corner of the tech world that's mushroomed, um, the idea that you've got Facebook, which has such potential and, and, and real, as it turns out, you know, control over so many aspects of our life, our economy, our democracy, uh, that there would not be the most elemental check and balance, you know, according to good corporate governance. Um, is that that Those are the kind of issues we speak out on. We don't... Do it on everyone, but on the on the on the ones where we think we can make a difference, we do. It turns out the only the only check on Facebook right now are the employees who are who are are quitting in protest over the the uh, 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 resistance to uh, doing what Twitter did on on fact checking uh, content. Yeah. Um, fascinating. So on the on the pension front, uh, but we do have this this horrible unfunded. Uh, uh, liability. What is the, when is that bill going to come due? Uh, and, and, and are we looking at a, an Armageddon at some point? Well, uh, Arm, Armageddon, uh, you know, may be a strong word. We, we have, it, it is, it, it's noted by anyone who looks at Pennsylvania's finances, um, that our pension funds have, depending on when and which you're counting, Let's call it, you know, fifty-five cents on the dollar for every dollar they owe, um, and in the long run, that is very, very bad news. Uh, it's bad news for the beneficiaries, most of all, um, people like my mom who you know spent time in public service in one way or another, and who were, you know, who deserve these pensions that they were promised. Um, it's it's bad news for taxpayers. Bad news for those of us who want to see the state uh, make much more vigorous investments in higher education. I mean, we talked a little about a program I'm very proud of. We didn't talk about the other 95% of what needs to happen in higher education, which is, if, in my view, a fairly dramatic rethinking of what we're doing about it. Um, but, uh, you know, so there a couple of good things have happened. There was a, there, there was a bill that uh, folks on both sides didn't love that that uh, you know changed pension benefits going forward. Um, uh, there was a, a in part in that there was a commission established that said, uh, look at the investment practices of the two funds, look at what they're paying, and make some recommendations. And again, bipartisan. I was vice chair of that. Um, it came up with uh, a way of saving uh, ten billion dollars, um, shaving that off the unfunded liability. Uh, which would be a meaningful difference in that percentage I gave you, um, basically by getting serious about saving fees. Um, you yeah. know, looking at consolidating with two different, almost identical investment operations, um, and one of them, uh, particularly high fees, that just simply haven't worked. Um, so this is a work in progress. One, I think, fund has been more responsive than the other. Uh, but if folks in Harrisburg take that report seriously, uh, it's literally a recipe for a way forward in this in this intractable problem. But look, is that number I gave you of fees paid out to Wall Street um, in one year? That number was actually more than a billion dollars for one pension fund. As long as that's the case, I mean, yeah, there's going to be some kind of slow motion, uh, you know, slow motion meltdown. And by the way, imagine the incentive effect of a billion dollars in fees from just one fund in one state. There is going to be an army of people here from Wall Street who will be in pro the status quo. So this is a this sounds like a weedy subject, but it, it really isn't. It goes to it goes to whether we're going to be able to invest in higher ed or in education um, the transportation in the future. It That's goes to whether people like my mom are going to be taken care of. And for folks listening on the line, it goes in a very concrete way to whether we want to keep using public dollars to enable the you know the the this distorted inequality that we've seen it's the root of so many of our troubles uh, so i i hope more and more people pay attention to this issue
I think you're right. That that that's the real issue. There won't be an Armageddon. There will just be less and less left to invest in education and infrastructure because uh, we're already seeing it in Philadelphia. Sixteen percent of the city's budget is goes to just uh, uh, paying the unfunded uh, liability. Um, the, the other thing I should say here, though, this, this is important for many years under governors of both parties, um, some of which you and I know, um, the state shorted its contribution to the pension fund. And that has something to do with why we're in this in this mess. Now, I also think that you know, that, that, that a think that a a a, a uh, infatuation uh, with Wall Street snake oil has something to do with it too. But the state has shorted the funds for too long. For the past several years, that's not been the case. The state has been even in COVID. We've you know we've uh, the state budget makes the payment that's required, and that is an absolute component of how we get out of this going forward. But to get to a place we can be happy about, you know, we really need to rein in those fees. And I want to keep those dollars in Pennsylvania pockets. We're going to. Uh momentarily open us up to some questions. If anyone has a question for uh, Treasurer Torstella, you can write it in the ask a question box. Uh, but before we get to that, uh, Joe, um, you've had, you've, you've uh, worked for three sui generous leaders, I think. Uh, Ed Rendell, Barack Obama, and George Herbert Walker Bush. Uh, I can't think of anyone who might, who, 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 uh, other than you, who has uh, a window into uh, leadership skills. What lessons have you learned uh, from such disparate leaders? Yeah, I think disparate, disparate leaders and different lessons. Although I will tell you, I'm sort of thinking about this now for the first time. I, I actually think in some way they speak to a speak to a better place than we've been and a time i hope we can get back to uh where leadership was about finding ways to get to meaningful common ground outcomes um, as opposed to sharpening our divisions and scoring points um, which i think is the biggest contrast between two of those and their current successor in Washington. But um, but they were different. Um, from Ed Rendell, for whom I worked when I was uh, much younger, um, I, I think my, and, and he's responsible for a, sort of a lot of my public career. And uh, I think above all, what I learned is the power of persistence and determination. Um, I saw him as mayor, fairly up close, I saw him at the Constitution Center. Um, I saw I started working for him when he was a 17 to one, rated 70 to one against um, odds of you know winning the nomination. People and forget that Peter yeah. Hearn. Peter Hearn was the favorite. Correct. <laughs> um, Ed Rendell had and has a never say die, uh, utter sheer persistence quality. That over and over again, I saw him in public life will good things into being, um, you know. And and I remember all the times he pushed me, you know, where I was where I was wrong, uh, you know, or at dark moments in the Constitution Center's history. Um, and I I think some of that rubbed off. I I, I mean I, that's one of my sort of operating principles. From President Bush, whom I worked with at the Constitution Center, uh, who was an extraordinary man. Um, Above all, the, the power of decency and kindness. Uh, it, you know, hit the, the story about him is the, 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 the handwritten notes he used to send, which I think often gets retailed as a kind of a political, this was his political gimmick. He was, I used to say he was the most decent public figure I'd ever met. Um, and then I sort of revised that. He was simply among the two or three most decent people I've ever met in my life. Um, yeah. He found out some staffer at the Constitution Center he'd never met that her father had died and sent her a condolence note. Um, we had a board meeting in Texas in the 88 degree heat, uh, and he spent a good you know nine hours um, working for us. And all the board members and all the donors were gone, and the only people left were the staff of the Constitution Center. And he stood out in the Texas heat calling until everyone got a taxi to get back to the airport. Um, he heard at a board meeting a, a, 
a report on contributions. We told him, of course, when we got him on board, we told him didn't have to give any money, didn't have to do any of that. He heard a report on contributions and I could see the little light go off in his head. And he scurried out of the boardroom, went up to his apartment, came back with his checkbook and wrote a substantial check. And I he said, Mr. President, we told you you didn't have to. He said, well, I didn't understand. I said, it's not something I have to, it's something I want to do. I'm going to be, I'm not, you know, I'm, I, want, I want to lead by example. Just, I mean, the number of stories I can't, I mean, I, I don't even remember them all it, with, with a kind of a, just good humor and kindness, just an abiding kindness to people, uh, you know, uh, across every rank and station. It was really quite remarkable. It will always stay with me. I'd like to say that it's rubbed off. Um, people working with me might say it hasn't. I, I try to remember it uh, and it will, it will stick with me for the rest of my life. And from, from President Obama, with whom I worked, I mean, as part of his administration, and I'm, I'm amazingly proud of that. Um, I did not work as closely as I did with the other two, but I actually saw things from sort of a 30,000 foot view. Uh, and from him, I think the, the, the importance of grace and patience and kind of a peaceful quality in the hurly burly of of uh, politics and public affairs. He just exuded, I would see him come to the UN every year, a fairly hostile environment. And with all the slings and arrows, he just sort of exuded an American presence that was who I thought we were, who I hope will be again, um, who we haven't been in a while, but a kind of a, 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 a dignity and a grace uh, that is who I imagine a president should be. Um, Again, I, I don't think I've internalized that as much as I'd like to, but I try. So I, I can't think of any uh, uh, different personalities than 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 uh, Ed Rendell and Barack Obama to be, because Ed was all heart, right? I mean, that's one of the things you love about him is he's just driven by that big, beating heart, uh, and and the, you have the cool prof professorial uh, Obama. So it speaks to your your ability to uh, be a chameleon, I think, <laughs> in some ways. Uh, let's go to uh, questions. We only have about 10 minutes left. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll read one to you and maybe Shabman will get someone up on the, uh, up on the, the, the screen if they want to, if anyone wants to come up. Um, uh, here's a quick question that I'm, that I'm not sure I understand, but you, you probably will. Uh, do I have to elect for the debit card on the PUA site or will it automatically be mailed? <laughs> so PUA is the program for what we call the gig economy, um, the new and, and Washington did some useful things, not enough yet, but in, in terms of COVID recovery. And that is unemployment for people who don't have conventional jobs. It's a new program. Um, and I urge everyone who thinks they may qualify to take advantage of it during this crisis. Um, short answer, um, under current circumstances, you will be mailed uh, the debit card in the PUA program, um, in part, largely in part because of a despicable fraud that's happening nationally and internationally. Uh, so we are issuing um, those payments through debit card. You do have to apply for PUA uh, and uh, we will get you, Larry, we'll have post on your website before uh, the time is over a, a, an email for Treasury uh, if you have any particular questions. But the debit will, card will come to you automatically. That's great. Uh, we're joined by a citizen. Hi, Hi. Kelly, is it? Yes, my name is Kelly. Can you hear me? Yes. I can. Yep. Hi, okay. Kelly. Hi, hello. Uh, Kelly from Philadelphia. Uh, my question was about you sort of answered a little bit about um, the basis for your continued hope in the in public institutions living up to the ideals they espouse. And you talked a little bit about um, Ed Rendell and his sort of notion of persistence. Um, I'm wondering if there's, I guess, quite frankly, how you don't get disillusioned or discouraged. Like the persistence seems like a quality of just being stubborn, right? Like, I'm just gonna keep going for this thing regardless of, of you know, what's happening here. But internally, how do you not let that seep into you and become embittered? 
Kelly, what a great question. Um, I'm going to answer a couple of different a couple of different ways, um, and I'm going to start with the, the the total 100% truth, which is I do get disillusioned and I do get discouraged, um, and I I what I do though is I I go I get back to my point of hope, and you know Larry was talking about the differences between Ed Rendell and George Bush and Barack Obama, and actually. Part of Ed Rendell's determination was, as you called it, a kind of a stubbornness. Um, part of it, though, is what Barack Obama would have called hope, um, which is a, you know, no matter how bad it gets, and it's gotten bad. And I think we're living through a moment where, um, you know, where we're being honest in some ways about how, how bad certain issues have gotten. But we kind of, in, in our political DNA, needs to be the belief that no matter how badly we've done, we can do better. And in my own life, um, I have days, in fact, I won't give you the details. I had one before this call where something, where I've been working, you know, working on pushing a boulder up a hill and it rolled back down over top of me. Um, and what's going to happen is I'm going to, you know, I'm going to go downstairs, probably with another glass of wine. <laughs> yeah. And tomorrow morning, I'm going to get back up and I'm going to, I'm going to try and push it back up the hill again not from so much a place of stubborn, although maybe I am, but more from a place of, of hope. You know, there was a, there was a Pew study recently. P people have lost trust in our public institutions, often for good reason, um, often because for a good, I want to say three or four decades, there's been a political campaign to discredit the institutions that has not helped. Um, but what we need are, are for folks to remember that, you know, when you care about an institution and public institutions are so vital, there, there are simply things that we cannot do without them. Um, when we care about an institution, you have to dedicate yourself to reforming it. Um, useful, useful reminder for our time, um, not ever to walking away from it. Um, so it's easy for those on the, you know, on the far right to just throw stones and, and try and embarrass government. Um, it's also easy for folks of my political persuasion to say, you know, more government. But the harder thing to do is to say, I want better institutions. This Pew study came out, Americans actually are desperate for this. They get it. They get that they, you know, that, that we need institutions. We need institutions to be responsive to all the communities they're supposed to serve. Um, we just need leaders to step up and remember that kind of hopefulness and combine it with the Ed Rendell determination to say, we're not going to rest until they stop failing us. I hope that answered. Thank you. Yes, yes. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry. I know we're not, not supposed to answer follow-ups, but I'm, I, do you see a difference between caring for the institution versus caring for the people it's meant to serve? So you mentioned like, you know, your commitment to the values of the institution being, is that at odds with caring for the, the people or needing? Oh, I, I think sometimes it can be. I think, I think you need to care about public institutions because they are supposed to serve us. Um, so you, you know, there are there are public institutions um, that have not been well served by their desire uh, you know, to avoid change. Um, and a lot of what Larry talked about, a lot of my career has been about pushing change in places that didn't always welcome it. But and I've been accused. I mean, but I come to that because I believe in the purposes of those places. Um, so, and I think when that's true, you've got to hold them to a higher standard, not a lesser one. You know, because I care about government means I have to be harder on it, not easier on it. That's that's sort of, you know, my my take on things. Because this is all about to go back where we started. It's all about we. I mean, it's all about these institutions are supposed to be serving us, and when they fail in serving us or some part of us. Um, it is time, you know, we have to rededicate ourselves to reshaping them into what they're supposed to be. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Kelly. You know, uh, Joe, you, you said something that, that harkened back to, I'm going to date myself here, to Gary Hart, mm -hmm. because you said, you said it's not more government or less government, it's better government, which is, uh, which, which was his rallying cry. And, uh, 1984, well, 1987 was when he was the heir apparent. And and it occurs to me that that's, that's the sort of 
reform-minded outlook, a non-ideological reform-minded outlook that you're championing? Well, look, there there are going to be ideological, there are going to be issues where we, you know, where, where we can't agree, but I think too much of our conversation can quickly devolve into more versus less. Now, and by the way, on that question, I think we have underinvested dramatically in all kinds of public needs. But if the conversation is that, we're doomed to you know be in our corners uh, and be at, at, at be at a sort of stalemate in America for a long time. The conversation needs to also be um, how do we make things work? Um, look, I could have said to you, I, I want to go to Harrisburg and I want to, you know, I want there to be a tax funded investment in universal kids savings accounts. And we'd be here today and be telling you about my wonderful idea that has not been enacted. <laughs> right. okay? but, but that's not what I'm about. And when it comes to thinking about government, I, I particularly think because going back to Kelly's question, I think because if we go back to you know many decades ago, I think there's been in some ways a deliberate effort to try and you know, discredit government as a tool for solving problems, so that we so that we end up saying, well, that we can't actually make a dent in in these inequalities. Um, and I think that's been sort of really pernicious. But I think when we when those of us who believe in government don't don't make our give ourselves the task of holding it accountable and proving to taxpayers that it can do good and useful and, and efficient things, then we're aiding the people who really want you know, government to go away and for everyone to fend for themselves. Um, so I, I come at this from the time when I was at City Hall is if you, if you care about an institution and you care about the purposes of an institution, you have to hold it to a, you know, what's sometimes a tough love standard. You know, you, you talked about we the people. Um, that first, that phrase, right after that phrase is this, and I think I've... Hey, Treasurer Chris Allen. Hi, everyone. This is Shadman with the Philadelphia Citizen. It looks like um, we just lost Larry. Something must have happened with his uh, internet connection. But um, uh, Treasurer Torsella, I, I'd invite you to, you know, uh, finish the statement that you were talking about with Larry and, and offer some uh, closing remarks to the event. Thank you so much for, um, you know, having this conversation today. And I found it great. And I, and I can tell from the comments um, that a lot of people also found it very engaging and are excited about your leadership. So thank you. Sure. I guess I will. Um, uh, I mean, thank you, everyone who's on. This is this has been uh, interesting. And it's it, actually goes to the sort of idea we're talking about, uh, about community, especially in this time. It's one, it's, it's kind of wonderful to find new ways to connect and new ways to actually use technology to do that as opposed to isolate us. Um, but what Larry was talking about, I've always believed that, that those are the three most important words in all of uh, political history and in all of American history. Um, and I think we are living through a time that is asking us to see clearly the ways in which we failed those words, um, as we have done repeatedly in, through our history. Uh, but the, if we use that phrase, we the people, as kind of our touchstone um, and ask whether something builds us into more of a community or separates us, um, uh, it will be the kind of North Star and has been for me in my kind of political thinking of where we go. In Pennsylvania, we have a different way of referring to it, we call it a commonwealth. Um, but this idea that we are all in this together, um, that there is no one who should be left behind, that there's no one we can afford to leave behind, um, that we can't tolerate um, you know, for any period of time for the kinds of inequalities that, have, um, that, that we've allowed to persist. If we use that as our kind of essential political ideal, I think we'll get back to the right place and go back to Kelly's question um, that's what gives me hope, and I hope that's what um, gives some of you hope, and I hope that that, um, however we express it, is what animates all of our public service. So I'm going to just end by thanking you for the opportunity. I've enjoyed it a lot. Look forward to coming back sometime.